when I first walked around the site after we were in ownership of it, it was, it was incredibly exciting. It was a blank canvas where we could create and showcase a different and more sustainable way of looking after this land that benefits wildlife, it benefits the wider environment, it can still produce food, but also invite people back onto a landscape that they've been excluded from for generations. Traditionally, Dorset Wildlife Trust buy land that has something special living there. Whereas for this purchase, we did almost the exact opposite. We specifically were on the lookout for something that really didn't have any ecological interest because we are trying to create more space for nature and we can only do that if we start targeting these bits of land that aren't really good for what they're being used for at present. The reason this bit of land isn't particularly good for farming is because it's got incredibly complex soils. It starts with chalk, it then moves through very thick clays that can go as hard as rock in the summer and as squidges porridge in the winter, down through gravels, acid sand, so that had to have quite high levels of input. I'm Julia Davis of We Have the Power. When the State of Nature report came out, like many people, I was shocked about how bad things were. And I was in the fortunate position at that time where I had some money that I could spend to do something about it. So I came up with the idea of lending money to uh, Dorset Wildlife Trust so they could acquire some land. Um, I work here at the Dorset Wildlife Trust on their rewilding site, Wild Woodbury in Bear Regis. Make sure it's in properly. One of the really important things I do is the ecological monitoring. It, it was quite sad to start with because it's 400 acres, but there wasn't really a lot around. The site is an ex-intensive farm. You walk across whole fields and you'd, you'd see nothing. When the Dorset Wildlife Trust bought the site, uh, the intensive farming stopped pretty much immediately. They took their last crop and then that was it. And we saw wildlife return really quite quickly. Within a couple of weeks, we had hundreds of wood mice move into some of the arable fields. And not only were they helping the soil quality for us, but they were also being prey for things like uh, buzzards, kestrels, also stoats, weasels, foxes. Over the next few months, we really started to see the site recover quite quickly. In the arable fields in particular, we had all the bare ground specialists start to grow, carpeting whole areas of field that were previously just bare ground and barren. With this vegetation you get the invertebrates moving back in. So right from the off we were seeing nature where it hadn't been for, for hundreds of years. <laughs> oh, that must be like a little mating courtship thing. He's kind of tapping her legs, isn't he? Mm. Oh. She's just eating him? Yeah. That's it, he's gone. There was a survey done when it was being farmed and we had two singing skylark. Within the first year, we're already up to 18 singing males. So an increase that's unthinkable, really. You don't even know where they come from <laughs> to, to colonise the site. We've had now over 100 species of bird move in. Yellow hammers are in every single hedge. We've had breeding woodlark and tree pipit on site. Species that you don't necessarily associate with this landscape but already within the first nine months are using it to breed. Also migrant birds. Things like nightjar have been feeding on the site every single day. Your wind chats and your wheat ears and your red starts. They were seen in spring and again this autumn. They're around site at the moment. And it's great to be able to know we're providing for a whole host of different birds at different times of year. Hundreds of house martins, sand martins and swallows all up in the air here and that's actually brought in a sparrowhawk and a hobby, which are in turn hunting them. All these swallows and house martins and, and sand martins are on their way south migrating and they're here feeding on insects to get their strength to, to head on south. Last year, they weren't feeding over these fields. This year, after just one year out of farming, they're all over these pastures and, and, and exterrible fields. Because there are suddenly insects here, there's food here. 
up until now, the changes that we've been seeing are incredible. It's been, it's been so exciting coming in to work every day and seeing just change. Some expected, but a lot unexpected. Next week, however, we're moving into the really fun bit. My name is Rick Bossens and I work for Alaska Ecological Contracting. Lower, lower the edge so the water can get back in the channel. And that'll be As part of the rewilding project, we're restoring the natural water flow patterns across the site. We're sandwiching between two rivers. So we've got the Beer Stream on the west, which is a chalk stream that feeds into the river Piddle that goes down into Pool Harbour. But most excitingly, and where we're stood now, is on the headwaters of the River Sherford. And we've got the opportunity here to do something quite groundbreaking, literally, and, and quite unique. The movement of water across the site is the basis for where the ecology will develop. So when I thought about what rewilding at Wild Woodbury is trying to achieve, I thought we actually need to think about rewilding the water as the first step. The land here at Wild Woodbury has been drained extensively over many years. Their objective, which was to try and make the land dry enough to farm, was to get water off and downstream as quickly as possible. And to do that, they dug very straight and very deep ditches all across this landscape. Every hedge here hides a very deep and straight ditch that just shoots water off downstream. And the problem of shooting off water from, from land as quickly as possible is not just that it can make flooding um, occur downstream. It also deprives our wildlife of incredibly important wetlands and complex wetland habitats. This is an example of an artificial ditch that is running through this woodland. All of this area in front of us has been dug up and, and put either side. The low ground actually is over here in the woodland. We knew what we had to do is to get the water out of the ditches which aren't in the low point of the land, into the low point of the land. Computer analysis allowed me to create a great map which showed the space where water wants to be. And from there, I was able to come up with a plan of how to actually join the water back to where it should be. Just downstream of that so that we can what we're doing here is effectively undoing this man-made drainage system. We're scrubbing it out, either by releasing water where it's embanked or filling in sections of ditch so the water just can just spread onto low ground and choose its own path. We want this to come down through the low ground, the yeah. natural low ground in the wood. Right. So we want to stop that reaching here. Use earth. Use earth. It's a fantastic opportunity for us all to, to get this site really good for wildlife. This is the first time I've been to the site for a few months now. Every time I come back, you can see nature coming back to life. I was so fortunate to live in a world where, you know, I saw hedgehogs on a regular basis. The birds were just abundant in our garden, and I want that for my children. I want that for everybody's children. So across Wal Woodbury, in the future, there will be more tree cover. The vast majority of those will self-seed, but we are going to do a little bit of planting. The project that we're doing today is working with our local primary school, coming out to the site, collecting acorns from under the local oak trees, taking them back to school, planting them up where they can learn about how they seed, how they start to grow. You know what, I think that one 
is actually starting to just... Well, I found this in the ground, which is just sprouted. We're going to propagate them, grow them over the winter, and then hopefully in the spring when we've got some little seedlings, we're going to go back to site to plant them. It's kind of laying down a marker because it's an 800-year project. The aim being, in 800 years, we will have eight 800-year-old oaks growing in a living henge. We want to teach our children about how we can look after our environment, so it's really good education for them, and also being part of a community project I think is really, really important for them. I was amazed and really surprised, actually, of the level of support and understanding that the project's had. When we hold our open days with the local community, people are just so ready to accept and say, oh, I understand why you're doing that, that, that will be great to see. People have been excluded from places like this just as much as wildlife, if not more. Now I've been waiting and waiting for some rain and it's finally here and I'm so excited. Uh, I should have brought my coat probably, but um, we've carried out all our river restoration work on the headwaters of the Sherford, but we've not been able to see it yet working, functioning, because we just had no water. It was so dry this summer that there was no water up in the headwaters of the Sherford at all. So we've just had our first decent chunk of rain over the last few days, and I cannot wait to get to some of the areas that we've been working in to see what's happened. I was actually on holiday the week we got some first heavy rain. I kept getting these messages from Rob and videos of Rob of him splashing around in all the water and I just wanted to get back and get back and see it. Finally the place transformed. There was water was coming from every direction. You could hear the water kind of moving through the landscape. What's really exciting is to see the water now flowing through the woods just as it should be and heading this way. This piece here is a fantastic example of where the water has been taken out of the big straight ditch and now occupies the flattest part of the woodland. We've got little pools developing, we've got flowing water, we've got multiple threads. The water is unconstrained to do what it wants to do. The approach here had to rip up the book of how you think about a river. Rather than a single line, it spreads in fingers as a sheet of flow across the landscape. We're not re-wiggling channels, we're not doing a more traditional river restoration. We are letting the water do the work and letting that water settle into whichever direction it wants to go. Thinking about a river in this way is a very new concept. River scientists call this stage zero, the most natural that a river may have looked in the past. Sometimes it makes multiple channels, sometimes they will dry up, sometimes they'll create small wetlands, and it will be an ever-changing system of, of wetness. I'm splashing my way through this field on a completely new flow path on the top of the Sherford here. Look at these flows across across the low the low grasslands here. This is just going to be fantastic for for birds, for amphibians, uh, for plant life. The diversity is really going to take a massive boost from this. The difference already in the colour of the water leaving our land is so marked. I used to describe it as hot chocolate. That's just the soils being washed away. Uh, it's now crystal clear. Wetter soils sequester carbon much quicker than, than pretty much any other thing you can do on land. Slowing water down cleans all of, all of the excessive nutrients like nitrates and phosphates that we're pouring into our river systems through intensive farming. One of the big aims of this project is to protect Pool Harbour 
where the River Sherford and the Beer Stream both empty into from a massive build-up of, of nutrients which cause huge algal blooms and huge problems for wildlife there. Not only have we stopped putting those inputs in, when you have wetlands you can really quickly start sucking out nitrates from the water and so you're actually releasing much cleaner water down into the harbour. Having wetter land and being comfortable with holding that water to the benefit of others downstream is quite alien and that's why this project is going all out on collection of data from bacteria in the soil, worms, birds, reptiles and plants and anything in between but we're also doing extensive soil surveys looking at the level of carbon already sequestered in the soil so that we can monitor the change and that we'll be able to share with many different people to hopefully inspire and inform other projects. A lot of people see rewilding as abandoning land and that's, that's simply not the case here. We need to get a more natural level of extensive grazing and we'll be using hardier older breeds so they can survive out in this landscape all year round, they can give birth all year round, they'll be able to survive in the winter and they'll be able to deliver to me what I need from them, which is random disturbance, which makes it incredibly dynamic, which is what our wildlife loves. This way of looking after land and landscapes is, is far more sustainable than the previous farming system was. It's far more sustainable, actually, than if we were trying to create and sustain specific habitats as part of a nature reserve as well because we're essentially using water and nature to do to do our management for us this is super exciting this for me this is where the whole conservation sector needs to move to the nature reserves that are here currently are great they're great pockets to move out into the wider landscape but we need the wider landscape to be able to accommodate them the reason I'm so passionate about this project is because it's so meaningful. We have to start thinking of new ways of dealing with our landscapes if we're going to survive. We cannot grow food without wildlife. We can't drink water if it's, if it's polluted and it's shooting off to sea. We've got to start thinking about things in a different way, otherwise we're going to be in some serious trouble. It doesn't matter how much money I store up for my children. In a world dealing with the effects of dangerous climate change and we've allowed biodiversity to completely collapse, they're not going to be safe. They're not going to be living in a world that I want to bequeath to them. If these projects were popping up, you know, four or five in every county, the amount of land we could restore and the amount of connectivity we could restore around the country would just be absolutely incredible. What I love most about being involved in World Woodbury is that every single time I, I come to the site, something has changed. And that's so freeing, it's so inspiring, and it really fills me with hope. <laughs>